was our, our first real neuroradiology leader. When we got here in 2013, there really weren't any well-trained neuroradiology uh, attendings. And we had to encourage uh, people to be crazy like us and come take this on. And so BU's been through the ringer, you know, starting a program from zero, whether it's neurosurgery, radiology for that matter, with, with a, you know, you can imagine we're all used to having certain support, the magnets, the, the staff, doing certain types of imaging really at a high level. And I have to thank BU in this forum for all that he's done. And neuroradiology is super cool. You know, I've learned as much of neuroradiology potentially as neurosurgery in my life. And having great neuroradiologists is part and parcel to a great program. You know, it's gotten even better with teams. Uh, we are able now to share screens with each other and review films while I'm sitting in my office. So the threshold to get an expert on the line is essentially gone. And bdu has been a real proponent of that. And uh, it speaks to his creativity and his hard work and his grit and it's of how well we've done. So you ought to be really looking forward to his presentation today. I'm sure it'll be super cool. And uh, BU, thanks for jumping on early and I'm gonna take off the OR. Okay, thanks, David. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Linger. Thank you for your time. Bye. We all really enjoyed. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm just uh, starting a little early. So I'm going to try to get my talk um, going. So please let me know if you guys see it. Uh, is it up, Melissa? Not yet. Okay, let's see. Okay, it's up now. It's up, right? Okay, yeah. so you see the main screen. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I've been working with uh, David for the last, uh, I think about eight years or so. Um, it's a pleasure uh, being here um, at Lenox Hill. Um, one of the benefits of unlike being a neurosurgeon, as you can see, I'm at home in uh, New Jersey and uh, you know, I'm able to, being a radiologist, we can really uh, work from anywhere. So um, if you do hear some background noise, unfortunately today um, the uh, uh, tree cutters have come on our block, so I apologize for that. Um, so does anyone know what a neuroradiologist uh, does? Anybody? Okay, so what we do is we specialize in the diagnosis and characterization of abnormalities of the central and peripheral nervous system, the spine, head and neck, and using various imaging uh, techniques. Let's see, this is, all right, there we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna see if I can move this. Okay, great. So neuroimaging uh, techniques include uh, various techniques to either directly or indirectly image the brain and spine um, and head and neck. Today, we are exclusively going to cover the brain. So the main two main techniques that we're gonna talk our computed axial tomography, uh, CAT scan or CAT, uh, C CAT scans and CT scans, and magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. Uh, other techniques are angiography, uh, myelography, nuclear medicine involving uh, PET CT. Okay, so I know you can't be here at Lenox Hill, but this is a close up of what a modern CT scanner looks like. So basically you have the, this is where the patient is going to sit and then you have the, uh, the, uh, the scanner um, and this is where the table is gonna go through as the patient's being imaged. So how does a CT scanner work? Well, uh, there are rotating X-ray beams which pass through the body and then the amount of absorbed radiation is measured by a special uh, detector. The computer then analyzes the data and transforms it into a digital image. And CT has a unique ability to image soft tissue, blood, and bone. Okay, so often you'll hear the term multi-slice CT. So what is that referring to? It's more than just slicing bread. So what that really means is a CT scanner has multiple detectors 
And basically with CT, we acquire our data set through axial images. So you can see here's the scout topogram. The patient is lying on that table that I showed before. And you can see this blue line so that the CT scanner is gonna take multiple slices through the area of concern. In our case, we're looking through the brain. And then it's going to generate this type of image. And this is an axial image through the brain at the level of the temporal horns, which are these hockey shaped type of structures. Okay, so now we can take that axial data set and we can reconstruct or the technologist will reconstruct those images into a coronal or sagittal plane. So our coronal plane goes through the head from a anterior to a posterior uh, 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 dimension. And a sagittal image is either going right to left or left to right. So that's how we dissect the images. Okay, and so we get these two type of images. So this is what we refer to as a brain window, and this is a bone window. So you can see that these are very different. So if I look at the brain window, I can see the brain parenchyma, I can see the ventricles. If I look at the skull, it's really just whited out, right? This bright structure. Whereas if I look at the bone windows, I can really make out the inner and outer tables of the skull, I can make out the medullary cavity. However, when I start to look at the brain, it's all really grayed out. I really can't make out the frontal horn. I can't make out any of the gray white diffusion. So when we wanna look at bony processes, this is what we're really gonna look for, or if we're gonna look for calcium. So we're gonna look at our bone windows. When we, we look at our brain windows, we're gonna look at the soft tissues inside the cranial vault. So this is that concept of windowing. It's the process which, where the CT image, grayscale component of an image is manipulated and by the CT numbers, and then we can highlight different types of tissues. So if you can see the numbers, this is our center, which is at 30, and our width is our window level width is at 66. Whereas if I look at these more blood-like type of windows, you can see that it's much wider. The window level here is at 321 and the center is at 43. These are much more narrow windows. So we're gonna to get to look more of the brain parenchyma as opposed to these wider windows. Okay, so what does CT do? CT measures the density of tissue. So there are various CNS structures. So um, blood, for instance, we give a measurement value of 56 to 76 Hounsfield units. Now Hounsfield, the concept of Hounsfield units is arbitrary. Okay, so what we've basically done, we've taken CSF as measuring zero and we presume CSF is true water, but it really it, it isn't. And then bone is taken as 1,000 and air is taken as negative 1,000. So you can see I put this ROI or range of interest in the calvarium on the left side. I don't know if you can see this number and we get a measurement of 963. On this image, I put my ROI in the corona radiata and you can see that the value is 23 and this corresponds to a white matter tract. So if we're not sure of what a density of a structure is, we can put these ROIs on our pack station and get a measurement and then kind of figure out what things are. And the, the Hounsfield units is our uh, uh, designation of uh, measurement density. Okay, so what is this gentleman and the Beatles have in common? Anyone? No takers, I guess different generation. Well, this is Sir Godfrey uh, Hounsfield, who's the father of the modern CT scanner. 
And he worked for a company called EMI, which was the same company that the Beatles used for distributing their music on the Apple label. So there's a common belief that the profits that generated by the uh, sales of the Beatle albums were used to finance uh, the, the development of the CT scanner. And this has really been revolutionary uh, contribution to medicine. Okay, so let's look at these three images. Okay, so the image on our left is uh, an area within the left frontal lobe. Does anyone wanna comment on how we would describe this finding? Anyone, we have a lot of shy uh, participants, huh? Um. People are writing in the chat. I'm not sure if you could see, oh, but I there's a lot of oh, <laughs> there's a lot of responses. There's okay, normal white matter, abnormal hematoma, right. hyperdense, abnormal clots, sporadic, okay. dental reason, I don't see the uh, I don't see the chat. Oh, okay, let me. I got the chat button open. Okay, great. Can you see okay. it? Yeah, I got it. Someone said there's hyperdensity in the left frontal lobe. Absolutely correct. Great. So this is hyperdense. Awesome. Okay how we describe things on CT. So if I compare that to what the frontal bone is here, you can see that this is very similar. So it's similar to bone or calcification. So this is calcification in an arteriovenous malformation. Let's take the- um, Someone's just wondering what hyperdense, what hyperdense means. Okay, so we arbitrarily assign a description to CT. So CT, since we're looking at density, we say things are isodense, similar to a structure. Um, so we can use gray matter, right? So we can say the real way to describe something is, is to say it's isodense to gray matter, but we tend to say it's an isodense structure or isodense lesion. Whereas something that's hyperdense is really bright. Things that are low dense are dark or similar to CSF. So hyper is bright, is an easy way of thinking of it. Iso is similar to brain parenchyma. And then hypo is very dark or similar to fluid or fat. You can't really see the subcutaneous fat on this image. Okay, so yes, yeah, so another thought someone put in, could this be an um, uh, oligodendroglioma? Those are tumors that uh, have a high incidence of calcifications, so almost 50 to 70%. Um, so let's look at the second image, okay? So the second image, anyone? So how would we describe this? Can you see the chat? Uh, I'm seeing the chat, okay. Yes, Hyperdense as well, right. That's, you're absolutely right. So now when we look at the density of this, remember, is it similar to this? No, this is not as hyperdense as the calvarium or calcification but it's hyperdense relative to the rest of the structures on the scan. So this is a intraparenchymal hematoma within the basal ganglia, okay? So this is hemorrhage, this is calcification. So if I wasn't sure what I could do is put an ROI or a range of interest and get a Hounsfield measurement. So blood would be somewhere from 50 to 70, whereas calcifications or, uh, would be almost a thousand or so. Okay, let's look at the final image. So how would we describe this? Okay, great. So it's hypodense, right? So one of the, being a radiologist, we'd like to compare things. And so what we tend to do is compare from right to left. So if I cut the brain through, the, through a sagittal slice from right to left, you can see this is what the normal left uh, hemisphere looks like. And then on the right side, we've lost some of this sulci, and then we get this well-circumscribed hypodensity. Radiologists love to describe things in terms of shape, in terms of food, or all these analogies that we uh, tend to make. So this is almost a wedge-shaped uh, area of hypodensity. Someone asked, is this fat? Well, here you can kind of see that this is the subcutaneous fat within the skull within the scalp, excuse me. So if you look at the density of the, of the of fat, it isn't as um, hypodense as compared to this uh, area in the frontal lobe. So this is, um, this is a uh, area of an, of an acute infarct, okay? 
Someone asked, how can you uh, differentiate a tumor from a cyst on imaging? Well, we look at all the different characteristics uh, and we'll go through that in the rest of the, the talk. So we look at the morphology, right? So benign lesions, um, as well as neoplastic lesions, for instance, can have calcifications. We with CT, we look at density, right? So cysts tend to be more hypodense. You can get cystic masses, and I'll show that uh, a case later in the in the talk. Um, and then we look for patterns of enhancement. So tumors, not all tumors, but more high-grade uh, high lesions or more aggressive tumors tend to enhance. Cyst tends shouldn't enhance. Sometimes they can have some thin areas of uh, enhancement. Okay, let's go on. Okay, I think somehow we're very slow in going. Okay, great. So let's look at the this lesion that I'm outlining. I think we're having a problem with right to left. I guess the images didn't get flipped. Um, so how is uh, this lesion uh, different from the other hypodense lesion that I showed before? Well, if you look what's happening, this is the surface of the brain, right? So when we describe masses, um, I don't know if you guys learned this yet or it's uh, come up, but we describe things as uh, um, extraaxial or intraaxial. So extraaxial refers to uh, a mass that is outside the brain parenchyma. So if we look at the left frontal lobe here, we can see the sulcine cortex going out to the inner table of the calvarium. But on the right side, we don't see that, right? We see this large space and this frontal lobe is being squished uh, by mass effect. So this lesion is outside the brain. The density of this lesion um, is hypodense, right? So if I look at my frontal horns, which are, which are somewhat being displaced by the mass effect and indented, it's kind of similar, right? So this is again, hypodense. So this is an arachnoid, someone said subdural hematoma. That's a good thought. Um, this is an arachnoid cyst. One of the ways I know that this is an arachnoid cyst besides the density characteristics is if I look at the skull, right? Now I know we're showing, I'm showing you guys a bone window, but look at the width of the frontal calvarium on the normal side compared to the contralateral side. So you can see that there's thinning of the bone. So this is a long standing process. So a subdural hematoma, say a chronic subdural hematoma, which tends to be hypodense, will be, um, um, wouldn't cause this scalloping or thinning, okay, or remodeling of the frontal bone. Okay, so let's look at this example. So again, if we look at this frontal convexity, we can see that there is this dark structure, right, on both sides, more so on the left than on the right. Again, it's pushing on the, on the brain. And we can see, again, some other areas of hypodensity, right? Really very dark, uh, almost black. And you can see another dot here. We can see some within the intrahemispheric, posterior intrahemispheric fissure. We can see stuff in the quadrigeminal plate cistern and ambient cistern. And then along that right tentorium, we see two additional dots. Okay, so any any thoughts on what this could be? Air, great. Someone said a couple of people said air, fantastic. So this is pneumocephalus. This is air inside both the ventricles and the cranial vault. Okay, so this is so. Then the question is, how did air get there? Right? Was there a fracture or was this iatrogenic, meaning introduced? Um, this is a post-op patient, and that's how um, there was a craniotomy, and that's how the air got inside the, uh, the head. Ooh, something. Okay, sorry. This is, sorry about this. This is 
Okay, so let's take a look at what's going on here. Okay, so I'm showing you guys a soft tissue or brain window and a bone window. And does anyone see what the, uh, the finding is? Great, so someone said a bullet. Wow, okay. So yeah, so there's this metal density in that right paracellar region. So this is the anterior clinoid process. This is the dorsum cella. And if I look on the left side, this is what the normal paracellar region should look like. And boom, on the opposite side, we can see this metal density. And the reason I know this is metal is when I go to my soft tissue windows, I can really see all of the streak-like areas coming through. That's the, so as the CT scanner um, is measuring the density of tissues, it's getting a big discrepancy between this metal fragment and the rest of the bones and uh, brain tissues. So it's not registering this as well, and it's giving us all of this streak artifact. So someone, I think, in the chat said uh, a bullet or um, so th this was, again, something iatrogenic. This is probably something that Dr. Ortiz did, okay? So um, there was an aneurysm, there was a, a posterior communicating artery aneurysm, and he coiled it. So what it, that means that he went in, in the groin um, all the way up, putting a catheter uh, into the intracranial circulation, and he put coils inside the aneurysm to, uh, uh, to obliterate the aneurysm. Okay, so we can also see uh, foreign bodies on, on CT. So this isn't a bullet. So another clue is if you saw a bullet, you'd see a trajectory of the bullet. And often you'll see a little bullet fragments going to the larger bullet fragment. And obviously that would have a, a crush injury into the calvarium, which we don't see. Okay, so CT is really the workhorse of what we do in neuroimaging. It's useful for trauma. So if uh, an MVA, an assault, they come into the emergency room, they typically get, uh, depending on the symptoms, they'll get a head CT, a cervical spine CT, facial bone CT. Um, it's great for the detection of acute hemorrhage, um, especially subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, for strokes. So the way we work up our acute stroke patient, um, they come in immediately into the emergency room. They bypass everything in the ER and they go right to the CT scanner and they get a um, CT of the head, a CT perfusion study and a CTA of the uh, neck and intracranial uh, arteries to, to look for uh, uh, a stroke as well as a potential uh, embolism causing a occlusion of a vessel so that they can get uh, endovascular therapy. So as I showed, we can CT is really great to look for calcifications. So MR is really bad to look for bone. Um, so non-neuro um, uh, 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 um, uses for CT more so in head and neck imaging is looking for sinus disease. So MR uh, is really not the way we look for run-of-the-mill sinus disease or temporal bone disease. Because again, we want to really look at bone. So that's why CT is really the way to go. What's the difference between, someone asked here, what's the uh, difference between hematomas and hemorrhages? Okay, so um, hematomas are really, uh, it's, it's very similar, okay? So they're, uh, when we say, we kind of describe what that hematoma or hemorrhage is. So I showed you um, a intraparenchymal hematoma, a parenchymal hematoma within the brain, right? A subarach, so then we say subarachnoid hemorrhage. We don't typically say subarachnoid hematoma. So subarachnoid hemorrhage is within sulci. They're outside the, uh, the brain. And um, we'll go through uh, some examples in a in a, in a minute. Okay, so uh, since someone asked about subdural hematomas, so let's look at a subdural hematoma. So here we have two images from a CT scan, right? 
And these are brain windows because again, I can see the brain parenchyma very well. I can make out the gray white differentiation. This is at the level of the lateral ventricles. Okay, so remember my uh, rule uh, uh, 101 for a radiologist is you wanna compare right to left. So I'm gonna cut the brain in half right down the middle. And so let's look at the right side and then the left side. So anybody, so can anyone see what the differences are? Okay, so I see a lot of LOLs, right? Someone wrote there, um, the left side is hyperdense. There's, and so then someone question is acute versus chronic. Okay, so you're absolutely right. This is a large left hemispheric subdural hematoma. So it's not only along the frontal convexity, it's along the parietal convexity and along the occipital convexity. So the whole left side of the head. And if I look at my normal side, I can see sulci going out to the inner cortex, right? So these are sulci. And you can see on this side, I don't see any of the sulci because that's the mass effect from the hematoma. It's pushing the the left side of the brain inwards. And because of that mass effect or displacement, if I look at what my normal right lateral ventricle should be, you can see that the posterior portion of the left lateral ventricle and the atria are being compressed. So this is mass effect. And if the mass effect is really significant, it'll push the left side of the brain to the right side. And that's called midline shift or subthalcian herniation. This is an acute subdural hematoma because of the density. It's hyperdense. So again, if I put my ROI or put a measurement here, you can see you would measure that would be anywhere from 50 to 70. A chronic uh, subdural hematoma tends to be much more fluid-like. So it'll be closer to zero. So someone asked, what is mass effect? So mass effect is that there is something pushing on this left side of the brain, okay? So there is, in this case, it's a subdural hematoma causing the mass effect or compression. A brain tumor can also have mass effect, right? So there's some space occupying lesion that is causing a displacement of normal structures. Remember, the outer cortex of the brain, the surface of the brain should really be along the inner table, right? So it should be touching and all of these sulci should be going out to the outer table. None of that is happening on this side. So that's why I know that there is a process outside of the brain pushing on the brain. Uh, we'll talk about contrast uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so contrast uh, is really used if we want to further characterize a lesion. So if we're worried about a brain tumor, an infection, we tend to give contrast. But routinely, we don't do our studies with contrast. Um, so people also, there are um, um, uh, effects of contrast, right? So it's an iodinated material. Some people are allergic to iodine. If you're allergic to shellfish, you can have a contrast reaction. With uh, gadolinium uh, is a contrast agent that we use in MR. Um, that also is much more safer than iodinated contrast material in terms of reaction. But there are, are, are uh, one of the controversies of gadolinium is that there's deposition. The gadolinium compound deposits in the brain and we don't know what the effects of that are. So I am a big uh, uh, proponent of not giving contrast. So if I can't answer what uh, uh, the lesion is, then I, I'll use contrast, but I tend to do most of my work without contrast. Someone asked, would a craniotomy be performed to drain the hematoma? Yes. Uh, so it depends on the side, size of the hematoma. Typically, if anything's greater than 10 millimeters or so, um, depending on the mass effect, is if there's midline shift, if there's downward uh, uh, herniation, and if the patient is not doing well, those are all reasons to, to do a craniotomy and drain the subdural hematoma. 
Okay, so we had some talked about subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if you look at this image, you can see hyperdensity along the interhemispheric uh, fissure. You can see hyperdensity within sulci. You can see hyperdensity within the sylvian fissures bilaterally. So remember my rule of thumb of comparing right to left. If you did that, it looks the same on both sides. So you may be fooled, but this is really very hyperdense uh, within the CSF spaces. So I know that this is subarachnoid hemorrhage. If I look at this case, this is a lot more subtle, right? So if I look at all of these sulci along the interhemispheric fissure, they should be normal low density, similar to CSF. But if I look at the central sulcus here, there's this linear area of hyperdensity. This is a minimum, a small volume of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So when asked here, how do you use other contrasts if someone's allergic to contrast dye? Well, it depends. So for instance, if you're allergic to an iodinated contrast material with CT, it typically does not mean that you can't get MR, uh, uh, gadolinium, the MR agent for contrast. Um, again, gadolinium is a, rel is a very safe compound. There are very few side effects uh, uh, in terms of allergic reactions with, with uh, gadolinium. So um, in that Sometimes then we are at an impasse if, we, if someone has a really anaphylactic reaction. Uh, we really don't like to give it. If it's a minor allergy where you get a rash, we can still give it. We're always prepared to give steroids uh, and Benadryl we have and atrophine uh, um, uh, available. And in a really severe case where we need to do a study, we'll have the anesthesiologist available uh, with us when we give our contrast agent really being prepared to, to treat a contrast reaction. Someone asked, is subarachnoid uh, caused by a brain aneurysm? Yeah, so when we think of subarachnoid hemorrhage in a non-traumatic etiology, right? Let's assume that there's no trauma. Our number one, number two, and number three reasons for a subarachnoid hemorrhage is a ruptured aneurysm. Someone asked, what's the hyperdensity in the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles? It's a good question, right? So this hyperdensity that you're seeing um, is calcification. So this is choroid plexus, which live in the atria of the lateral ventricles. And as you can see here, it's very similar to, um, to bone because it's calcified. That's a normal structure. Um, it's nothing to, to worry about. Okay, so this is a lot more nastier. Um, and if you can see the, uh, the calvarian here, compare that to the normal side, this is a comminuted skull fracture. So when I say comminuted, I mean there are multiple pieces. You can also see some gas within the area of soft tissue swelling. And they're even inside the brain. I don't know if you, can, you guys can see this little dot here. That's intracranial air or pneumocephalus. So remember on the other example, I said, how did, when we see air inside the brain, we have to figure out how did it get there? In the other case, that was from surgery. In this case, it's from a fracture so that there's a communication with the outside world and then gas got inside the skull. So these uh, fracture fragments are displaced inside uh, the brain parenchyma. So when you see such displacement, this is an indication that this is needs to be going to the OR to be fixed, okay? It's not a simple fracture. Are MRIs and CTs the gold standard for diagnosing hemorrhages? Yeah, so both are very good. MR really is the gold standard in the sense of we can, we can accurately stage the hematoma. So we can look at the signal characteristics. And again, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, whether something is immediate, uh, two to three days old, seven days old, 21 days old, or greater than a month when um, he, there's hemosiderin. But again, MR is much more sensitive for blood. So someone asked, what could cause such a localized fracture? So this is from trauma. This person was bashed uh, into their uh, head. I think this was a baseball bat. Um, when would one use CT over MR? Okay, so you know, similar to 
Uh, so in terms of trauma, right? So patients coming in immediately, they all go to CT. CTs are very fast. There are in most emergency rooms right in the emergency room, right? So they don't have to go upstairs. So we don't have an MRI scanner in our emergency room. So the, emer the MRI scanner is on the third floor where the radiology department is, and the emergency room is on the first floor where there's a CT uh, scanner. So the, all our trauma or stroke cases go right to CT. CT is very fast. Literally uh, doing a CT of the brain will take less than a minute. MR is not so easy. Um, it'll take about 20 minutes to get a diagnostic MR study. Um, and then you have to remember the patient's can cooperate, right? So someone with a severe injury may not be able to stand or stay still for MR. The crucial part of uh, getting a good quality MR study is you have to be able to stay skill, uh, still in the scanner. Many people, myself, I've been in the MR, I'm a radiologist, a neuroradiologist. I've gotten imaged multiple times. I have a hard time staying uh, still in the scanner. And a lot of us get claustrophobic, right? Um, as I will show you guys in a few minutes, the bore of an MRI scanner is much longer and you have to stay inside for almost you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, it's not easy to do. Then the magnet makes a lot of noise. That's why we give patients uh, earplugs or we play music. Um, it's not the most comfortable um, uh, experience uh, to, to have, to be honest. Okay, so anyone know what part of the anatomy uh, that we're looking at in this particular case? Spine, great. So we're looking at the cervical spine. Can anyone see the abnormality? This is the only non-head I will show during this whole talk. I Atlas and axis are visible. Okay, so here you're right. So one of our clues is we look at the soft tissues, right? So this is at about C3 to about C5. You can look at the soft tissues. They're hugging the anterior margin of the vertebral bodies, right? But if I look at my craniocervical junction, so this is C1 and this is C2. C2 is the dense. And this is the anterior arch of C1. This is the uh, uh, edge of the clivus at the basio occiput. And, you, and so here's the rest of the clivus. This is the sinoid bone. And if I can look from going down from the clivus, this is your nasopharynx. You can see all of the soft tissue swelling, okay? So that's my clue that if I look at the configuration of C2 or the dents, it's kind of angulated, bent forward. And then I see a line uh, through the dents. You can see an offset of the anterior and posterior margin. And then if I look at my coronal slice, like a crown, this is the lateral mass of C1, lateral mass of C2, this is the occiput, this is the tip of the dens. And then if I look at, through the body of the dens, I can see the C-shaped line, okay? So this is the fracture. This is a type three dens fracture. Um, these have the be best prognosis for healing because there's a much more larger volume of bone uh, in order to heal, okay? So I, um, there are different types of dens fractures. There are type one is through the tip of the dens, type two is through the base of the dens, and then type three going into the body of the dens. Okay, let's see if this came up. Okay, great. Okay, someone else asked earlier about foreign bodies, right? So take a look at this case. This is a pretty bad injury. So this, this was one of the uh, telephone uh, uh, workers uh, uh, from a telephone company who fell from the, the ladder. And this is a metal pole then went right through his, his base of uh, uh, his orbital roof, base of his frontal bone, right through the orbit and into the brain. You can see multiple fracture fragments uh, and this basically uh, uh, ruptured his globe. Um, so 
This is a pretty severe injury, but my point in showing this is this is where CT really comes beneficial also to look for foreign bodies and injuries, right? So MR is not what you'd want to send this uh, uh, individual uh, to. Okay, so let's look at this uh, image. We're going away from trauma now. Um, so how old do you think this individual is? You think this is a young person or an old person? And how do I know? Someone said a child, someone said a young person, young. I get a lot of youngs, pediatric. And then someone said, I think someone said old because of atrophy. Uh, so that individual is absolutely correct, right? So remember the other images I showed earlier in the talk, all of the sulci were really tight. The ventricles weren't enlarged. So you can see here are the frontal horns. These are the atria. And again, these are choroid plexus uh, that are calcified. Um, so these are dilated ventricles, dilated CSF spaces. So this is an older person, okay? And if, again, if I compare from right to left, what we start to see is we've lost some of this gray white matter differentiation. So that's a key term. So whenever I look at a, a CT, I wanna see a nice sharp gray white matter uh, interface, okay? And then if I look at the left side, remember radiology 101, I start to lose this sulci on this side. So, and, the, and then I've lost my gray white uh, differentiation. So this is telling me that there is some process, some edema going on. And this is an acute uh, infarct involving the right parietal uh, lobe uh, along that right MCA territory, okay? Someone asked uh, if this is hydrocephalus. Well, it can be hydrocephalus, but when, when we look to see hydrocephalus, especially a, communi a non-communicating means an obstructive and a communicating is dilatation. So we want to see all of the ventricles dilated, but the ventricular dilatation is disproportionate to the rest of, uh, of the brain. So then we know it's more likely going to be like an NPH or a normal pressure hydrocephalus type of scenario. An obstructive hydrocephalus is the result of something causing obstruction, right? So if there's a mass at the cerebral aqueduct, for instance, everything above that will be dilated because CSF cannot uh, egress out of the brain. Okay, how about, how about this large, very large lesion along the uh, frontal convexity? So this, how would we describe this, right? So we're gonna make you a uh, neuroradiologist. Okay. I know David would be disappointed in me, but I, I think he really wants to be a neuroradiologist deep down inside. Um, so you can see, if I look at uh, gray, gray matter, it's similar in density, right? So this is isodense, okay? So there's a large isodense mass. And then if we look around the margins of the mass, there's some more hypodensity, right? So this curvilinear area here, more nodular area here. So this is a meningioma, okay? So meningioma is gonna be iso to isodense. And you can see the mass effect, right? So look what's happening to the frontal horns. They're being uh, compressed. The hypodensity is edema. So let's look at this example. So if I look at my uh, brain windows, we can see this lesion very similar to the frontal cortex, right? This is described as hyperdense or very bright. So if I look at my bone windows, you can better define the lesion. You can see interstices within the calcification and you can see it abutting the inner table of the frontal lobe. So this is a calcified meningioma. Meningiomas often calcify. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears to CTA. With CTA, we give a contrast agent um, um, and then we inject rapidly uh, through the area of concern. So we'll basically give it through a peripheral IV. We give usually about anywhere from 80 to 100 cc's and we give a very Dr. high rate. Dr. Pramanik, um, some yes. people are wondering what it means to calcify and what causes calcification. Okay, so you can get different things can calcify. So tumors can calcify. 
you can get dystrophic calcifications. Calcifications really mean forming like bone-like uh, uh, processes, right? So you can get, um, so veins, uh, so I'm sorry, um, so atherosclerotic disease can calcify, right? So there are dystrophic calcifications where we don't know what the cause is of. A hematoma as it breaks down can calcify. Um, as I mentioned, tumors calcify. Strokes uh, can, if they hemorrhage, can have residual calcification. So there are a whole bunch of things that uh, can cause calcification. There are areas of the brain that are, have normal calcifications, like someone asked about the quarry plexus. The pineal gland can calcify. That tends to be much more normal. Other uh, calcifications can be more pathologic, for instance, for tumors, okay? Got it, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so what do we use CTA for? Well, we want to, in terms of looking at intracranial aneurysms, I know you guys will probably see some angiography and get a look at, uh, at uh, aneurysms, um, but we can do that with CTA and it's non-invasive. We can look at carotid occlusive disease. So patients with who may have a brewy with carotid stenosis can get a CTA of the neck. For stroke patients that are coming in who may potentially get intraventional uh, uh, a thrombectomy, we'll go right to a CTA looking at the head, the circle of Willis to look for a vessel occlusion. If patients have trauma and you wanna see if a vessel is injured, we'll do a CTA to see if there is uh, contrast pooling outside of the vessel or if there's some area of narrowing showing us that there's injury to the vessel. Okay, so this is a 3D reconstruction of the intracranial uh, circulation. So you can see this is the basilar artery. This is the superior cerebellar artery, superior cerebellar artery. This is the posterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery. This is your internal carotid arteries, internal carotid arteries. This is your anterior cerebral artery, the A1 segment, the proximal portion. This is your M1 or middle cerebral artery. This is your middle cerebral bifurcation into a superior and inferior division, which we call M2. But you can see how exquisitely we can look at these blood vessels. So this is that uh, same individual. Now we're looking at their chest and neck. So this is the aortic arch. So on this more closer uh, view of the aortic arch, you can see the three great vessels arising from the um, uh, aortic arch. So here is the inominate, uh, the common carot the right common carotid artery, um, and the left subclavian artery. And this is a more closer up looking at the carotid bifurcation. So here's the common carotid artery. It bifurcates into the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery. The way I know which vessel is which, the internal carotid artery is typically larger, doesn't have uh, uh, any branches in the neck, whereas the external carotid artery has all of these uh, branches. Okay, so this is so the idea with CT and geography is to look at the, at the blood vessels. Okay. Okay, so that was a 3D image. This is a MIP image or maximal uh, intensity projection. Here we still kept the uh, skull base. We didn't subtract out. So the way, if you saw the other images, those are done on a computer. So that those images are, if, I don't know if anyone caught it, it was from 2004. So back then, almost 17 years ago, I manually reconstructed those images using a workstation. Today, these are done nearly automatically or I can within one or two buttons on my pack station, I can subtract things out, make 3Ds very easily. So in the past, it may have taken me half an hour, 45 minutes to reconstruct images. Today, it's nearly instantaneous. So if I look at the right side, I can see this is the internal carotid artery coming up at you. This is the A1 segment, M1 segment. If you look at the left side, it's much attenuated and there's an area of, I don't see any contrast. So there's an occlusion of that left M1 segment. This is a patient who kind of came in for an acute stroke. So this patient would go right from the CT scanner up to the cath labs, uh, I think it's on the 11th floor, and go right into the interventional suite for uh, thrombectomy. 
Okay, so here are some more 3D images. Um, and here we can see an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. So another tenet in radiology is we have to be complete and we have to look everywhere. So the one of the things I tell my residents not to do is you jump to a finding, you say, okay, I found it, there it is. There's the large five, six millimeter anterior communicating artery aneurysm. But if you look more closely, it's a little harder to see. You'll see another aneurysm in the MCA bifurcation. And I think you can see it a little better with these MIP images, right? So an aneurysm is outpouching at a vessel wall, typically at a bifurcation. So this individual has two aneurysms, okay? Okay, we're gonna, this is uh, very dear to my heart, um, is CT perfusion, which is an imaging technique to look at the cerebral vasculature. So I started doing this back in 2002, 2003. And uh, we can look at various uh, uh, hemodynamic parameters. We can calculate cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, a transient time, and a time to peak. Okay, so this is the idea. We give a contrast agent, we, which an iodated contrast agent. We serially image parts of the brain. And then we take all of this data set. Um, again, oops, sorry, let me go back. This is one of the first, uh, I'll show you guys one of the first perfusion studies I did back, I think it was 2003. So I would manually have to take this data set, go to a workstation and post-process these images and make these images. Okay, so these are the color map images. I'm gonna, let's go. So here's my cerebral blood flow. That's the uh, flow within the cerebral vasculature, cerebral blood volume. The, uh, within the brain. So I would, I would make these uh, 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 color maps. And if we look at the cerebral blood flow map, you can see that there's an area where we don't see the color scheme, right? So here's my normal yellow and uh, uh, red hues, right? I don't have that. This is all in this purple to blue uh, hue, right? So this is an area of decreased cerebral blood flow. If I look at my cerebral blood volume map, you can see that it, there's less amount of decrease, right? So if I look at the right to the left, they look kind of similar, but obviously there's a deficit here in this left parietal area. But this deficit, the cerebral blood flow, is greater than the cerebral blood volume. So this is telling me this patient has an acute stroke. Now, um, almost 20 years later, we, there's this commercial uh, software that makes this much more easily so that it goes to a central processing area and literally within minutes uh, these images and analysis is given to your it goes to your cell phone you can get a text message from rapid uh, with what the findings are so let me show you an example okay so here's a ct done um, so the patient comes in goes to our ct scanner this is your routine ct with about 30 slices through the brain and this is sent automatically as this CT scan is done to RAPID. And then RAPID sends you this. And it says here, as you can see, no hemorrhage suspected, right? So it's, it's basically doing my job. And then if there is a focus of hemorrhage, RAPID will give you your suspected hemorrhage. And then it'll give you some images where the hemorrhage is. So this is really pretty cool. And the same thing, Rapid will take a CT perfusion uh, study and will make automatically generate these uh, color maps literally within a minute or two, um, which used to take me again, almost 20, 30 minutes. And then it'll give you this summary map. It'll tell you, the, it'll quantify the degree of, uh, of decrease in cerebral blood flow. Um, and then it'll give you a, a mismatch volume and a ratio. Uh, so it'll try to calculate a core uh, and a penumbra. The penumbra is the area of brain that may potentially be infarcted and is the one area that you want to save as opposed to the core, which is dead tissue. No matter what you do, um, that area is going to be dead. Okay, and so part of this rapid package, it'll really quickly reconstruct 
uh, the circle of Willis and look for any vessel occlusion. And so if there's a large vessel occlusion, it'll say LVO. And so this is done literally within a few minutes. So it kind of makes me feel like this guy, right? With a very small brain. And I don't know, so hopefully I'll still have a job in a few years. But I think David still, David Langer and John Bookfar still appreciate me. Okay, so if you were uh, visiting us, this is the MR scanner suite, one of our MR scanners. And one of the things you'll look at is this warning sign, right? Because there's a high field uh, magnetic uh, field that is uh, running. Melissa, how am I doing for time? I Right, I, I'm still good, right? You're doing great. Yeah, technically you're from 11 to 12, but because so you started I, I, early, so whenever, I'm good. Okay, no, I just want to make sure. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is a much more closer up uh, uh, of what an MR machine looks like. It looks, it uh, looks very similar to what I showed you for a CT scan, but if you look at the width of the bore, this is much longer. So here's the table, the patient will go in and your whole body, nearly nearly your entire body, depending on the region that is being imaged, is gonna go into this magnet. And you can see the opening is very short. This is a short bore magnet. We do have other magnets, which are open bore or, uh, I'm sorry, large bore or open magnets. And this is what makes it very claustrophobic uh, for uh, people. Okay, so, oh, I just want, the other thing I want to talk about, uh, about this, uh, um, so the reason we get this warning sign is because there's a high magnetic field around the magnet. So the way we, um, 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 uh, uh, oh, sorry, hold on. So uh, if you think, uh, so the way um, you'll hear different uh, strengths of a, of a magnet, right? So typically 1.5 and three Tesla that refers to the field strength. Um, so one Tesla is equal to 10,000 Gauss. And the Earth's magnetic field is 0.6 Gauss. So if you think about it, a 1.5 Tesla clinical magnet is about 30 times stronger than what's the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so I was, um, I know someone had asked, I, when I got into the chat, briefly got into the chat, I saw some questions to, to David about, uh, uh, medical school and BSMD programs. And so I want to tell you, I am a proud product, product of a BSMD program. And this is my spiel for BSMD programs. The beauty of a BSMD program was that I was a European history major, yet I went to medical school, right? So I knew at 17, I got into medical school, I could study whatever I wanted. And I always loved history. And so I got to be a uh, history major. Um, and so because of that, a lot of my talks, I, I throw in a little bit of history. Um, so Felix Bolich and Edward Purcell discovered uh, what was referred to as nuclear magnetic resonance uh, uh, in 1946 and received the Nobel Prize in 1952. Paul Lautenberg and, uh, uh, produced the first quote unquote NMR image in 1973. And then Raymond Damadian produced the first uh, human MR scan in 1977. Peter Mansfield invented slice selection and epiplanar imaging. The first clinical MRI was a GE magnet in 1983. Um, and I, I was fortunate to train at the University of Pennsylvania, which had the first GE magnet. Um, and then the Nobel Prize were given to Lautenberg and Mansfield uh, in 2003. So these are, this is Lautenberg and Mansfield, who again, further revolutionized uh, medicine. So that really things, if you ask people what um, changed uh, the way they practice uh, uh, medicine, it's really imaging. And that's because of the development of CT and MR. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so just real basics. So I, I mentioned that there's a high field magnetic uh, uh, magnetic uh, uh, field, um, and that's by this primary magnet. And there are three magnetic coils. So these gradient coils uh, produce this linear magnetic field in the X, Y, and Z planes. And they're radio frequency coils, 
which uh, send a signal and uh, what the signal that's bounced off from the patient is used to reconstruct a image. I'm trying to really simplify this as best as I can. This is, uh, MR is really much more complicated than CT. Okay, so we talk about sequences and there are various different sequences. What I listed above is the basic sequences that we use. These are the radio frequency pulses and gradients that are, that are used to uh, uh, pr produce a particular uh, appearance. So we refer to things as T1 weighted, T2 weighted, flare, which is fluid attenuated inversion recovery, um, diffusion weighted imaging with apparent diffusion coefficient or ADC maps, gradient echo imaging, and susceptibility weighting imaging. It's not really that important of the different sequences, um, but just it's really important to understand that uh, what they do. Okay, so unlike CT, where we acquire a data set in an axial plane, with an MRI, we can acquire in any plane. So here you can see we've cut down, um, this is a midline sagittal image right through the brain and upper cervical spine. So here you can see your craniocervical uh, junction. This is the pons. This is our pituitary gland. This is the optic chiasm. This is the corpus callosum. You can see your mouth. Here is your lips. Here's your nose. This is your frontal sinus. This is your cerebellum. Okay, so here's an axial image. This is a T2 weighted image. The way I know this is a T2 weighted image is because CSF is bright, whereas in a T1 weighted image, CSF is dark. This is a flare image in the coronal plane. So we tend to, when we do our basic MR, we tend to get one or two different planes. So the way I do things here is we get a sagittal T1 weighted uh, image because I want to look at sagittal T1 anatomy um, or sagittal anatomy. Um, and then I get a coronal image because I want to look through things in a coronal plane. And the rest of our sequences are done in the axial plane. Okay, so T1 is really important and it's really useful for anatomic detail. This tells us what the gray white differentiation looks like. Okay, so if you want to look at anatomy, this is what you want to do. T2 weighted imaging really tells us pathology. It looks because it's sensitive for the detection of water and susceptibility between tissues. The flare images null CSF and gives us T2 weighted information. And the benefit of flare is it looks at lesions adjacent to the, uh, to the ventricle, which we may not see as very well on the uh, T2 weighted images. So this really is my go-to sequence. So when I start off looking at an MR or someone asks me to do a consult, first thing I do is look at these flare images. Okay, so diffusion weighted images is sensitive to the microscopic motion of water molecules. This is the most uh, uh, sensitive indicator of ischemia. Okay, so someone had asked uh, before about uh, stroke uh, so an MR diffusion weighted image can pick up a stroke anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes. They should become diffusion positive, okay? So yes, the way to really diagnose an acute stroke is MR. The problem again is availability of MR. They take long uh, time. Patients, if they are uh, uh, obviously having a stroke or can't cooperate, um, uh, may not be able to go into the magnet uh, for that length of time. So one of the ways we kind of go around this is we, we will occasionally do a, an, a, a short MR sequence. So we'll throw the patient in if we're not certain and just diffusion weighted image to see if there's a stroke or not. GRE or SWI images is really good to look for blood and mineralization, typically calcification. So we talked briefly about uh, contrast agents with CT. Um, MR contrast agents are gadolinium. This is a paramagnetic uh, compound. And briefly what it does, it shortens the T1 relaxation time of protons, which causes signal enhancement. And, and I'll go over this in uh, a few minutes. Okay, so perfusion is similar to what we did with CT. We give a contrast agent and we follow it through the cerebral vasculature, unlike CT, where we're looking at 
density measurements, we look at increased signal due to T2 star effects of the contrast agent. And similar to CT, we can look at salvable tissue in acute strokes, as well as uh, look for um, perfusion parameters in, uh, in tumors, um, which we um, do here at LHH. Okay, so some basics, right? So I mentioned on CT, we talk about density. With MR, we refer to things as intensity, right? So if you are an MR snob, um, you don't want people to say density, really, it's intensity, right? So we describe things, again, similar to CT, as hyper, iso, or hypo intense. So hyper intense are things that are, again, very bright, okay? So fat is bright on a T1-weighted image. Hemorrhage, methemoglobin, melanin, contrast agents such as gadolinium, calcium, magnetines, as well as proteinaceous products uh, can be um, 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 hyperintense on T1. So the difference between MR and, and CT is we got to look at all our different sequences to come up with what we think something is. So when we look for fluid or CSF, it's hypo-intense on T1 and hyper-intense on T2. Okay, so again, here's some standard axial sequence. This is our T1-weighted image. I look for CSF, right? So here's my frontal horns, atria of the lateral ventricle, some sulci, it's dark. If I look at my subcutaneous fat, right? All of this stuff is bright, right? So that's, so this is what's telling me it's a T1-weighted image. This is a T2-weighted image because CSF is bright. So all the CSF bathing the brain, so I know it's a T2-weighted image. This is a flare image. This is a little trickier, right? So if I look at my ventricles, it's dark, similar to a T1-weighted image, okay? That's because with flare, we suppress CSF, right? So anything that would have been fluid, we wanna make it dark. By doing this, I can look at the brain around the ventricles, okay? And then the other thing, if I look at my gray-white junction here, if I look at my cortex, it's bright, brighter than the uh, 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 white matter, right? So the cortex here is bright. If I look at my T1-weighted image, if I look at my cortex, my cortex is, is dark. And if I look at white matter, white matter is brighter. So a flare image is the opposite in terms of gray-white when I look at, compare it with a T2-weighted image. I'm sorry, a T1-weighted image. Okay, so here are diffusion-weighted images. This is our diffusion weighted image, and this is the uh, corresponding ABC map that we look at. So when we say something is uh, hyper intense on diffusion, we want us in terms of an acute stroke, we want to see it being hyper intense on T1, and, I'm sorry, on the diffusion weighted images and dark on the ABC map. So we refer to that, that as restricted diffusion, okay, which means that the water molecules cannot move around freely. Okay, so they're restricted. Okay, so this is a GRE image. And, and again, as I mentioned before, this is the image. So if I'm looking for blood, blood products, calcification, this is the image I want to hone in on. Okay, so let's look at some uh, different uh, lesions. Okay, so this is, I'm gonna help you guys by labeling this. This is a T1 weighted image. Again, if I look at fat, uh, I can see the temporal horns here, which are dark, right? So hypo intense, and it's a little harder to appreciate gray white, but because of the CSF being dark, fat being bright, it's a T1 weighted image. This is a T2 weighted image. Another way I can look, I can look at the vitreous within the globe. So this is your eyeball. This is your lens, it's fluid filled, okay? And so it's bright. If I look at my prepontine cistern, uh, my cavernous sinus, which are another fluid filled structure, it's bright on T2. So that's gonna help me, tell me it's a T2 weighted image. Bone is dark. Okay, so anyone, how would you describe this lesion filling the fourth ventricle? Okay, so someone said cyst, that's a 
a great uh, 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 differential. Okay, so it's hyper intense, right? Hyper intense on T1. Then I have to think to myself, all of the different things that are hyper intense on T1. And then I have to look at T2 characteristics, right? So all the different things that are dark on a T2 weighted image. So is this fat, right? Similar to fat. Well, if I look at my T2 weighted image and look what fat is, this is a subcutaneous fat, or I can look in the fat in my orbit, my retrobulbar orbital fat, fat is bright, right? More dark, much more than what this is. So it's not fat, okay? Could this be blood? Yeah, it could be blood. And then I have to figure out this on MR, the stage of blood, okay? But, all right, so how am I gonna get a lobular focus of hemorrhage within the fourth ventricle? Kind of unlikely, okay? And so this is a, uh, a, a white epidermoid. This is a very rare lesion. So basically all of this is protonaceous and that's why it's dark on a T2-weighted image. I just show this for, for fun. All right, so let's look at this, this uh, case, okay? So this is a T2-weighted image, and I know that because, again, if I look at my CSF, it's bright, all right, it's hyper intense. Now, this is a post-contrast T1-weighted image, okay? So after we give our contrast agent, we use T1-weighted images, okay? Because we want to shorten the effects of a T1-weighted imaging. And so how do I know that this is, there's contrast on board? Well, I can look at the vasculature here, right? So these are some vessels. There's enhancement. If I look at the basilar artery, I can see contrast within the artery. Um, there's some, uh, um, this is a mucosal thickening and enhancement within the ethmoid sinuses, okay? So if I look at this structure along the left middle cranial fossa, right? Here is my normal, right middle cranial fossa. This is my anterior temporal lobe. Well, look similar to what we looked at, at on the CT, right? My anterior temporal cortex should go along the inner table of the middle cranial fossa. It doesn't. There's something pushing this temporal lobe, right? And there isn't any enhancement. I know this is dark on a T1 weighted image, so it's fluid filled, right? Or fluid like. Then I look at my diffusion weighted images. There's no restricted diffusion. It's dark, it's similar to fluid. So this is a arachnoid cyst, right? So now we're seeing an arachnoid, what an arachnoid cyst looks like on an MR. Okay, so let's, uh, sorry, there was a question. Uh, it's hyper intense on the left posterior fossa. Let's go back a second. All right, so um, we're not, we barely got a little bit of the posterior fossa. We're getting a, a little bit of the cerebellum. This is the uh, bottom of the occipital lobes. This is the medial aspect of the temporal lobes. Here's my temporal horn. Um, and again, the way I, I want to look at a normal temporal horn, I know it's the Stanley Cup playoffs and it's hockey, you know, it's the end of hockey season. And so the way you want to look at your temporal horns, it kind of looks like a hockey stick, okay? kind of a, a shape to it. And that's what should be a normal temporal horn and not dilated. Okay, so let's look at this example. Again, this is my uh, 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 T2 weighted image. And you can see that there's something pushing on the pons in the left side of the cerebellum. If I look at, this is again a post-contrast T1 weighted image. I can see some vascular enhancement, which is normal. And again, it's pushing on, on, the, uh, on the pons and pontomedullary uh, junction. And on the diffusion weighted images, voila, it's hyper intense, right? It's very bright. This is almost light bulb bright, okay? So, all right, so what kind of lesion is, is this looks like fluid, right? Because it's hyper intense on T1 and hyperintense on T2, it's not enhancing, okay? But if I look at my diffusion weighted images, it's showing restriction, okay? This is an epidermoid tumor, okay? So they are classic for being hyperintense on diffusion weighted imaging. Okay, so multiple- Dr. Patrick, Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, I just wanted to give you like a like three to five minute warning, like just- Oh, we're coming to, oh, okay. All right, so let me- Okay, no worries. I didn't realize. Thanks for 
Um, okay, so you know what? I'm just gonna skip a couple of things. I'm just gonna go over things really quickly. This is a cavernous malformation. We describe things as popcorn-like. So if you look at this hyperintensity around it, this is my GRE images and you can see that it's dark uh, because of susceptibility. Um, I just wanna go, over, let me see if I can do this. This is a post-contrast image. We can go over, I just, we just don't wanna take up too much of your time, but no, um, people, seem, people are really enjoying this, so. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I can continue, that's fine. Okay, yeah, so, so no rush, and then whoever needs to go can go. Okay, that's, that's fine. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep anyone either, yeah. um, but I, I can, it's okay. I, I can catch up uh, with my work. Um, so this is uh, gadolinium, so we gave uh, the contrast agent. So here is my pre-contrast T1-weighted images, and here is my post-contrast images, right? So how do I know that this is post-contrast? Well, I can look at some of these vessels, they're enhancing. Okay, if I look at this sulci here, there's some uh, in leptomenin there's some meningeal enhancement. Okay, so again, very know that. Uh, oh shoot, I do have to go in a few minutes. Okay, I'm gonna. It's okay. I'm gonna. I keep going. Okay, so here's my pre-contrast T1-weighted image, and okay, look at the right side in the. Uh, parietal lobe compared to the left side. Okay, so this is normal. This is sulci, 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 and boom, I've lost some of this sulci and I got this hypo intense uh, rounded area, right? And then in the middle of it, I got another lesion, which is kind of iso intense, and there's a central area of, uh, of, of dark signal. And so then I, we gave contrast, right? And so someone had asked earlier, why do you give contrast? Well, I wanna further characterize this lesion. This has some aggressive features. There's a surrounding edema and mass effect. And I wanna better delineate what this lesion is. Is that David? I'm, I'm still going, David. Hey, John, JB, hey. how are you doing? How are you, B dude? Sorry to interrupt, I just wanna say hi. Hi, good seeing you. Yeah. Um, and so John and I are house staff together many years ago. Uh, so it's always good seeing John. Um, and here are the post uh, contrast images. And you can see that there is enhancement, right? So if I look at what this lesion was, the circular rounded lesion, we can see that there is this brightness, right? So that implies that that contrast agent got into the lesion there's a breakdown of the blood brain barrier and that contrast agent leaks into the lesion. So how do we describe this, right? Remember I said to you, radiology is very descriptive, right? We like to use uh, 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 things to describe lesions and, and keep it in mind. Okay, so what does this look like to people? All right, great, someone said ring enhancing, right? Or ring-like, right? So we consider this peripheral enhancement, ring-like enhancement or um, uh, um, uh, rim enhancement, right? Because it's along the margins of the lesion. The central portion of the lesion is not enhancing. Okay, so the, the central portion in this case is actually pus, okay? It's infection. Um, so let me just, so here, here's the lesion and, and this is what to remind me to remember, this is, this is a very nice ring, in fact, um, and you can see um, that's how we describe this, okay? So many different things can be ring enhancing. One of them obviously is infections. Uh, tumors or uh, other lesions uh, can be ring enhancing. Demyelinating lesions can be somewhat uh, ring enhancing. Okay, so let's, okay. So someone had asked before about uh, hemorrhages, right? And how, are, how we can tell hemorrhages on CT and MR. So here to show you uh, a hemorrhage within that left uh, basal ganglia insular region, right? A hemorrhage, acute hemorrhage is hyperdense on CT. Um, and this is the same patient. This is the T1 weighted image, T2 weighted image. So on the T1 weighted images, we see something that's kind of ISO to maybe a little bit bright. On the T2 weighted images, it's really dark. We see edema uh, around it and so, and we can see um, um, edema around it. And then this is a, um, 
a subdural hematoma on MR, you can see how there's hyperintense signal on T1-weighted images along the convexity and hyperintense T2 signi signal. So this is another left hemispheric subdural hematoma. So this is the biochemistry of blood. So we start out at deoxyhemoglobin, and then we go to intracellular methemoglobin, which gives particular signal characteristics. We go to extracellular methemoglobin between a week to three to four weeks. And then as we get into that chronic state of a month or so, we go into the uh, uh, chronic component where hemorrhages look dark on both T1 and T2 weighted images. This is a slide just to say the same thing with uh, words. Okay, so you know, I think I'm gonna, I think this may be a good time uh, to stop. I've given you guys a whirlwind uh, tour through uh, neuroradiology. Um, and I'm just gonna, let's see. Oh, actually I should, I should show this last case because I think you're gonna see a lot of this um, with Dr. Bookfar. Um, and um, so you can see, this is what a, a GBM, a glioblastoma multiforme or a brain tumor uh, looks like. So we, it's iso intense on the T1 weighted images. This has much more heterogeneous irregular enhancement. There's edema around it and mass effect. And what really helps me is I do, we do perfusion. And then we look at the perfusion characteristics of this lesion and it's very hyper intense. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's very, it's taking up, uh, it's hyper perfusing, which is this red uh, uh, area. So this is a high grade tumor. And let me just, and uh, wanna thank everyone for their attention. I know um, I spent a lot of time with you guys. This is my email if, uh, anybody has uh, any questions, uh, enjoy your um, virtual rotation. Um, again, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks, thank you for Lisa. your time. Okay. We bye -bye. all really, really love this. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna... <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed today, and we'll see you tomorrow. Um, have a good day, everyone. Thanks so much.